Hi. Today's training will provide a high-level introduction to multi-host, multi-root, and SROV. Here you see today's agenda and the topics we'll be covering. We'll start with multi-host basics, features, and benefits. Then we'll get into PCIe bifurcation and dynamic configuration to help understand how a multi-host or multi-root configuration is accomplished. We'll then provide an introduction to SROV. Okay, so let's jump into multi-host. Multi-host technology enables direct connectivity for up to four hosts to a single network controller while keeping each host server completely independent from the other. Please note that the terms host and server are used interchangeably here to describe a fully independent host server that shares the NIC with other host servers. Each host will have a dedicated quality of service and host management channels. Each host can be powered on, off, or rebooted independently without impacting the other servers. No action on one host will impact any other host or the BMC's connectivity. Here we have a picture of a shelf or cubby containing three multi-host sleds. We refer to the chassis which holds the NIC and hosts that share that NIC as a sled, which you can see individually on the right. At the top of each sled, we have a single NIC, and below each NIC, we have four trays, each containing a completely independent host server. In this configuration, there is also a single BMC within the sled, which can manage the sled and each host. In this example of a 4U sized OCP cubby, we have 12 independent servers managed by three BMCs and connected by only three NICs and of course then three cables to three switch ports. So as you can see, this is a pretty efficient use of rack space, power, and cooling. Okay, so now we're going to touch on PCIe bifurcation since this is what allows us to share the NIC between multiple hosts or multiple root complexes in the case of multi-root, which we'll cover shortly. So put simply, PCIe bifurcation is just splitting lanes. PCIe bifurcation simply divides a PCIe bus into smaller buses. A multi-host NIC configuration is achieved by dividing the NIC's total available PCIe lanes by the number of hosts. So if we use a 100 gig NIC as an example, we would need 16 lanes at Gen 3 to operate at full bandwidth. In the table shown here, you can see that we could either service two hosts with by eight lanes each, giving each host a maximum potential bandwidth of 50 gig, or we could divide the same NIC between four hosts at four lanes each, which then will yield a maximum throughput of around 25 gig for each host. In these multi-host configurations, they're commonly referred to as 2x8 or 4x4, meaning two hosts by eight lanes or four, four hosts by four lanes. The OCP 3.0 specification defines signaling methods for dynamically configuring a NIC in numerous ways to support single host, multi-host, or multi-root applications. This allows a single NIC SKU to function in any of these personalities. The host baseboard can indicate to the NIC the preferred bifurcation configuration. It can allow support for single or multi-socketed baseboards with single or multiple root ports, which means that it can be used to drive the NIC for multi-root support. It can support single or multiple endpoints, meaning multi-port NICs. This is all done by driving OCP 3.0 spec-defined I.O. pins on the NIC's edge connector. These I.O. pins are illustrated here at the bottom of the graphic showing how the NIC and the host baseboard communicate configuration data. Next, we'll go beyond PCIe bifurcation and describe a couple of multi-host NIC configurations in a bit more detail. The graphic on the right represents today's traditional multi-host implementation. Here we show a 4x4 configuration, four hosts by four lanes each. These are connected to a 100 gig multi-host NIC in this example. From the network port side, we have a single port linked at 100 gig, which is then shared by four hosts. 
The host will each see that there is a 100 gig link. However, the NIC firmware is utilized to provide host isolation and ensure relative fairness via traffic shaping. That fairness means that the firmware will prevent any single, ho single host from utilizing more than its fair share of the total bandwidth. And each host is really limited to around 25 gig each in this case. There are, a, a, there are, of course, certain things that will be inherent to this design. Example, flow control, changing speeds, etc. That will impact all hosts because they share the same port. Now, if you're like me, you may be curious just what this all looks like from the system's perspective. So here we show what it looks like via LSPCI and ETH tool on a given host. Keep in mind that this would be the perspective from each of the four hosts in their respective OS installs. First, the LSPCI output for PCIe link capability shows a Thor-based NIC advertising that it's capable of up to PCIe Gen 4 by four lanes. In this example, that link status is Gen 3 by four, which is sufficient for 25 gig allocation. With this multi-host design, ETH tool will show the true port speed, which is 100 gig, even though the host will not be able to achieve the full 100 gig bandwidth on its own. Now let's introduce another approach to a similar four host 100 gig configuration. In the previous multi-host configuration, we had split the PCIe lanes of the NIC by four. However, the other end was, sh was a shared single 100 gig pipe. In this implementation, we actually split the NIC at both ends. So at the PCIe end, we again configure bifurcation as four x four. However, the same 100 gig quad SFP28 interface is also divided by four. We take each of the network certes lanes and divide those by four. We use the same QSFP cabling and change the corresponding switch port from a single 100 gig QSFP28 port to a 4 by 25 gig breakout. This is actually a simpler approach. So in this case, the NIC firmware no longer needs to deal with traffic shaping or ensuring bandwidth fairness. From the, NIC's, from the NIC firmware's perspective, this is really just a four port 25 gig NIC, which, which the same Thor chip is capable of as well. We have other SKUs that are in that form factor. So now let's let's see what this looks like from one of the hosts. All the same from the PCIe perspective, the key difference is seen via ETH tool. Now we see a link speed of 25 gig, which is dedicated and which this host will have full access to. Okay, so moving on to multi-root. Before we jump straight into multi-root applications, let's talk about how a modern multi-processor server with multiple root complexes is laid out and where the inefficiencies lie. So as shown in the graphic, each CPU socket has its own local memory and will have available PCIe connectivity via its own root complex. It's not isolated. Instead, there's an inner processor bus between the sockets, allowing communication to the other side. So CPU zero can communicate with PCIe devices attached to CPU one's root complex and vice versa. Of course, communication between a CPU and its local resources is gonna just naturally be much faster and more efficient than access to non-local resources. Communication across the inner processor bus adds latency, overhead, and reduces overall performance. So now let's look at a multi-root NIC solution to this problem. Multi-root uses PCIe bifurcation to connect directly to each side, making the NIC local to both root complexes. This can be done in a four socket configuration as well, splitting the NIC by four within the same server. When you do this, then neither CPU will need to traverse the inner processor bus for NIC access. Again, coming back to how this then looks from the system's perspective, in this example, we're using a single port 100 gig Broadcom Thor based adapter, which has been bifurcated into two eight lane links, each routed to a different root complex within the same server. 
that now appears to the host OS as, a, as two interfaces. So if we scan the PCIe bus, as we show in the screen capture, we can see that each of the interfaces is on a different bus. So this slide is intended to compare single host versus multi-host versus multi-root. We see the first two examples of a single host multi-socketed server and how it can be it can route the NIC either traditionally or by leveraging multi-root. On the right, we see multi-host represented and you can appreciate the similarities to multi-root, at least from the NIC's perspective. Okay, so our last topic will be an introduction to SROV, which stands for Single Root I.O. Virtualization. Let's begin by outlining a traditional approach to providing network connectivity to a virtual machine. This is done with a virtual NIC or vNIC. A vNIC is, is an emulation of a physical adapter, and it's then bridged to a physical adapter and controlled by the hypervisor. A VM is then assigned one or more vNICs. The vNIC in, turns, it in turn is then assigned to a virtual switch or a vSwitch. The vSwitch can transfer data between VMs within the same machine and outside machines on the physical network. The drawback to this model is that the vNIC's I.O. performance is just not as good as with the physical adapter. Also, the use of the vNIC and the vSwitches is burdensome on the hypervisor's CPUs. An alternative to using a vNIC is PCI pass-through. With PCI pass-through, this allows a VM to have direct control of a physical PCI device. The hypervisor essentially gives up the device, so any device provided to a VM via PCI pass-through is then no longer available to the hypervisor itself or to any other VM. When this is done with a NIC, the VM is directly connected to the outside network and the vSwitch is then bypassed. The advantage to this approach includes near-native NIC performance for the VM and it greatly reduces the network-related burden on the hypervisor's CPU since the hypervisor is no longer processing data via the vNIC or the vSwitch. The drawback is that then this obviously requires separate hardware for each VM that you want to pass a device to. So with that background, let's introduce SROV. First, it's important to understand what a PF is versus a VF. So a PF is a true full-featured PCIe physical function or port, whereas a VF or virtual PCIe function is a slimmer or a, a lightweight PCIe function, which is associated as a child partition of the PF. SROV is an extension of the PCIe specification. A single Broadcom Thor PF can be partitioned to advertise up to 256 VFs. And each VF has its own PCIe config space and shares an external physical network port. SROV is similar to PCIe pass-through in that it provides a VM with direct access to hardware. As with PCIe pass-through, the vSwitch is again bypassed. With that, the VM then gains I.O. performance and the benefits of direct hardware access. Also, the hypervisor again is is its workload is reduced because it's not dealing with the overhead of another VNIC or traffic on the vSwitch. So essentially, SROV takes PCIe pass through to the next level by allowing uh, a NIC PF to pass through direct hardware access to many VMs at the same time. The hypervisor also maintains access to the PF at the same time. So a hypervisor can still also share the NIC as a vNIC to other VMs if preferred, or it can be done in any combination of. So you might think of SROV as shared PCI pass-through. Okay, so in this final slide, we can see the differences between a traditional virtualized server without SROV versus with SROV. On the left, we have a single NIC physical function, which is then assigned to a vSwitch and then vNICs which are assigned to the VMs. On the right, we again have a single NIC 
physical function configured with Phoenix, and SRLV VFs configured in a combination. All right, well, thanks for watching.